Hi, my name is Sandy Baird. I'm an attorney and an activist in our community, especially around issues concerning our Constitution and especially free speech. I'm here with my colleague, Barry Cade, who's an attorney also. Um, and I've known Barry for years. He's always been a free speech advocate, but he's becoming now somewhat of an expert as both of us are seeing continued threats in our country to the First Amendment. So uh, we're here to talk about that today, and I hope people are watching us because this is the most important issue and the threats to free speech are the most important issues, I believe, facing our democracy. Um, anyway, Barry, welcome to CCTV and to what's happening. So what is Thank happening? You. you have been studying, I guess, the trends in the free speech? Yes, um, not necessarily uh, in terms of uh, case law, but what's actually happening around the, around the world and especially in the United States. Um, for a long time I've had a, a saying that the road to totalitarianism is paved with exigent circumstances. Mm -hmm. uh, whenever there's some kind of emergency and a perceived enemy, the first victim of a cold war or hot war is freedom of speech. Um, we can't have people listening to what the other side has to say or critics of our own side. Uh, also, you've been an, also in your life an anti-war activist also for right. years, and maybe you could uh, tell our audience okay. in terms of what your background is besides being a lawyer. Right. Um, in 1962 or three, I organized the first draft card burning uh, since the Korean War, and that was in what New was York City. What was that all about? What, what was the date? I, I don't. I think it was '62 or '63. I don't mm -hmm. remember for sure. And you were 63. a mere child, right? I was a mere child at about 18. Mm -hmm. No, 19. If it was '63, I was 19. Okay. Um, but uh, at 18, we were, everyone, every male was required to register, and then given a status. One uh, A meant you were ready to be cannon fodder. Um, some of the. De deferrals, which I don't remember the classifications, were for students, for fathers. Married people, too, at first. Even just married? Yep, okay. at first. Then, then, then fathers, mm -hmm. uh, and then somebody engaged in uh, you know, work that was in support of the, the war effort. Um, but at that time, there was no war effort uh, when, I, in, when I first burned my draft card and became involved. Um, but there was a big war that was heating up. Uh, in 63, Vietnam was in the news. Right. But I think at the time, the U.S. had uh, several hundred advisors uh, and not supposedly not actually engaged in combat. Wait a minute, wait a minute. 63 was also the year that President Kennedy, w Kennedy was shot and assassinated. That was in November, yeah. Right, right. Okay, so this was to set the tone, America was already embroiled in yeah. many of the issues that haunt us today. Right. As I said, 62, was, it might have been 62 uh, that I burned the draft card. And that, that was in New York City. Where? And was that? I thought. I mean, it was outdoors. <laughs> okay, one of, it was outdoors. One of the parks. Yeah, right. You know, that was, I don't remember what I had for, oh, I didn't have breakfast. Um, mm -hmm. But anyway. Uh, it was at one of the parks in New York, and there were about eight or eight or so of us that burned our draft cards. And at that time, uh, there was a law that required you to have a draft card on your person. Um, at, they had not yet passed the law making it illegal to burn it publicly. I think destroying it might have been uh, illegal, but. We were not arrested. Um, I didn't get arrested until I actually uh, refused my draft, which was in 1965. Okay, for those of us who are too young to remember the draft, remember we don't have one, that was, the draft was an institution, virtually, right. that forced young men to be in the army or in the military service and go to kill or be killed. 
right? And there was no, no, no. It went to serve their country well, right. and uh, enhance democracy around the world. Right. I forgot that part. Okay. Okay. But in in effect, it was an order that your body would be right. sent to fight to kill or be killed. Right. Well, that was um, if you received the draft notice. Right. But the draft legislation actually required every uh, young man at 18 to register. Right. And um, and you had to fill out paperwork for, and then you were classified. And um, and you said by 1962 I had uh, flunked out of school, and therefore was. Uh, ready to be cannon fodder. I act, had been active in anti-war movement for several years, and uh, myself and a couple of other uh, draft resistors uh, signed a pact that if they arrested one of us, they would have to take all of us. Don't ask me why it, I, I really, you know, I guess we were hoping that it would start a movement of draft resistance and what our role in, in the actual draft resistance movement that uh, really gave the government a lot of problems. Uh, whether we were in any way uh, a significant cause. Are you kidding? Cause. It was hugely significant. It was, yes, but what, Usually. You know, hmm? Right. Um, but there had been, after, after our incident, there had been lots of draft card burnings, and including one where um, uh, the person who did it was had been arrested and sentenced to prison. I think his name was something Miller. Mm -hmm. um, and then what happened? What happened with you? Well, what happened with me was nothing from that incident, but in July 6th, I think it was, of would have been 64, um, Russ Goddard, one of the other three, was arrested in St. Louis, and Gene Kyes, the third member of our group, flew down to St. Louis. Back then, airfare was affordable, mm -hmm. and um, no body cavity searches. Uh, we flew down there, and um, after he was sentenced, and he was sentenced to five years, which was the maximum for draft refusal, mm -hmm. um, the two of us, Gene and myself, sat in the judge's office, uh, chamber rather, refusing to leave. That was our act of civil disobedience. We wouldn't leave without, uh, without Russ. So the judge uh, accommodated us and sent us to jail with Russ for six months uh, contempt of court. And then? And then after I got out, um, I continued doing anti-war you know, activities, and in November, no, I guess it was like August or so of 1965, received the draft notice, which I refused, which I didn't go out, which I didn't go to do. In fact, I think on the date that I was uh, supposed to report for, in, or ordered to report for, for induction, um, some friends and I were picketing outside of the induction center, which we did fairly regularly um, you know, with signs urging people or young men, you know, draftees, not to submit to the draft. Now, if we did that today, uh, well, if there was a, if the draft was reenacted, and we did that today, I'm sure that would it would be illegal. Mm -hmm. It would be a conspiracy to uh, support commit terrorism. treason or support. support yeah, terror, terrorism right, would be right, involved right. In, in the charge. It always is nowadays. Mm -hmm. So you went to jail, in effect. Right. Prison, for your yeah. pri prison. I, I got a two-year prison sentence and with good time, six six months off. And if he, But if you add the uh, contempt of court, I served, not served, I, served, I right. was in prison for exactly two years, give or take a couple of days. And how was that? Well, I learned more than I did in college, I'll tell you that. Um, it was definitely an experience. Mm -hmm. um, I think it would be a lot more difficult today. Back then, it was federal prison, which is probably easier uh, than most of the state prisons. I mean, today, my understanding is, you know, in a lot of the harder states, if you step, accidentally step on somebody's shoe and they don't stab you, I mean, then they're considered a punk, and, mm -hmm. you know, so they have an obligation to, uh, 
get you back. To get to get yeah to get you to, to punish you severely for you know even an accidental uh, sign of dis disrespect. I always but I don't know how true that is. I always tell my young people that I know don't go to prison, don't go to jail. It really is very dangerous. It seems to me at right. this point. Um, I did wouldn't now, go ahead. Um, up until a few years ago, I spent about 30 years uh, doing draft, doing uh, prison advocacy. Right. Um, in fact, I got involved with that when I was working at your office, and um, we got a phone call from Robin Lloyd that she had organized a, uh, a meeting yes. about prison advocacy. And you said, well, I'm not interested, but maybe Barry is, and you passed the phone to me. Mm -hmm. And... Mm -hmm. uh, and well, that was my draft call. <laughs> yes, you see him. Uh, uh, and a week before that, we saw the movie um, Shawshank, Redemption. Shawshank Redemption. Best movie in the world. It is. It is one of my two absolute favorite. But it's also movies. it's also everybody else's favorite. You knew yeah, that, right? It, it was. I really strongly suggest that to anybody who's who thinks uh, prison is a good idea. Yeah, I know. Watch it. Okay, but but then that draft card burning really was. Uh, uh, impulse of free speech, right? right? So then why does, how does that connect you with what's going on now? First of all, what is going on now around free speech, do you think? What's going on now is the so-called war on terror, terror, or terrorism, whatever it is, um, has been used as an excuse to push the uh, establishment narrative, especially in terms of um, international threats, so-called, to the point where there's, there's censorship and what we see going on t today in the United States, which is totally inconceivable, is a, a, a statute was just passed equating criticizing the Israeli government's policies and advocating for Palestinians is, is legally anti defined as anti-Semitism, and if you commit anti-Semitic uh, activities, you can be de denied all kinds of federal government uh, opportunities and programs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that's in the United States where it's fairly mild. In Europe, fairly mild. compared yeah. to Europe, yeah. where, I mean, it, it's criminal. It's a criminal act not only to do the... Can, do those kinds of criticisms, but to host a website that allows it. And uh, a week or so ago, I don't remember his name, but the CEO of Signal, which is uh, oh. an online platform, was in and had France. resisted or refused to obey France's censorship laws. Was arrested. Was arrested. He had been visiting France, and he was arrested. And as far as Wrong. I know, he's still crazy. Yeah, um, I thought that was Telegram, though. Hmm? Wasn't he the head of Telegram? No, it was Signal. Uh, okay, I but, well, no, I, no, I think it was Telegram, actually. Okay. But he was, Maybe. he has been arrested. You're right, it was Telegram. Um, and, I mean, France, though, while sort of being a republic, sort of being like the United States, really is much more centralized, much more authoritarian right. than the United States. That's what's so shocking about the people of the United States, because they're giving up rights that were fought for long ago, and nobody's making a peep about it, or very few people. Um, and the first, okay, so I believe, and I might be wrong, that the Bill of Rights is unique to the United States. Even France doesn't have, they have something called Les Droits de l'Homme, which is the rights of man, but it doesn't include liberties as much as our Bill of Rights does. By that I mean liberty from government. France doesn't really right. like that much, you know. Well, ca Canada has what they call a Bill a, of the, Rights. No, they have a charter. They, yeah. have, they have something similar to the yeah. Bill of Rights, um, except Parliament can override it, yeah, at any a, time. a notwithstanding mm -hmm. clause. So, you know, we, we saw what happened in uh, in Canada recently when there was uh, the truckers right. boycotted, and for what would be a standard act of civil disobedience in this country, which would be punished or under ordinary law, um, 
Instead, what the Canadian government did was freeze the bank account of anybody that they knew to be involved and people who had donated Lots to of right donated to an organization that was opposing um, COVID, certain COVID restrictions. Just for donating to that organization, their bank accounts were frozen. Mm. Did they ever get them back? I don't know. I haven't heard that they have. I won't. I don't know. Okay, but in the United States, because of our uh, revolution and the making of our Constitution, uh, Americans at that time believed that tyranny resulted from the government. Right. Right. And that's why they passed a Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments to our Constitution. Correct. And those right. were rights uh, uh, that we had in opposition, in a way, to the government. And the government was not supposed to ever interfere with those rights, correct? And the first one was freedom of speech, freedom of expression. There are other rights, like the freedom to organize, the freedom to assemble, freedom of religion, and so forth. I think that that freedom to bear arms, too, the Second Amendment. So that's really quite unique to this country. And it seems like what is happening today threaten those rights. Well, let's go back to what happened when Thomas Jefferson was president, right. the Alien and Sedition Act. Yes. Right. Which, you know, people were arrested for criticizing the government's mm -hmm. foreign policy. Right. Well, what happened to those acts, the Alien and Sedition Acts? Were they ever um, overthrown? Let's see. I don't know if it's the same Alien and Sedition Act, no, but I know right. during World War I. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, right. Uh, the socialist uh, candidate for president uh, ran his campaign from jail because of... And he got a significant amount of votes, too, unlike yeah. most third-party candidates. That was Eugene right. Debs. You, yeah. Guess whose hero uh, is uh, Eugene Debs? Bernie Sanders. Oh, I thought you were going to say uh, Donald Trump. <laughs> no, no, no. Listen. However, <laughs> you know, with all of your and my criticism of Donald Trump, he is seriously being censored oh, as definitely. well. Oh, definitely. I mean, there's something I believe that's going on in this country that's really dangerous, and that's called the Trump derangement syndrome. You know, it, it, it forces people to act out of so much hate toward him, they're allowing for a real breakdown of our Constitution, yeah. it seems to me. He is being censored, right? A lot. Well, it, uh, mm, I think he gets to say whatever he wants to say. Sort of, yeah. Yeah. Um, he was censored uh, during his term, at the end of his term, okay. uh, from social media, mm -hmm. not by not by the oh, government. But yes, it turns correct. out, it turns out that th there were forces that were pushing the, the mainstream media to uh, censor him, and the social media, uh, like Facebook. I think he, was it Facebook that he was kicked off of. No, I, think I don't so. think so. It was. Th that or. Um, Twitter. Twitter. Yeah, it was Twitter. Mm -hmm. And we discussed that. And I dis you said it was censorship. I said it was a private company. No, no, no. Okay. But, but I'll, I'll, I'll retract my position. It was a form of censorship that's, for sure. That's good of you. But listen, I do believe there's a difference. And this is the difference. Censorship is occurring, which is different than free speech crackdowns. The crackdowns on free speech, if it's a government entity, that is a violation of the First Amendment. But if a private company does it, it's not a violation of the Constitution, but it is censorship. It is a violation of the Constitution if, right. if they do it because the government told them to. Yeah, told them to or threatened right. or, you know, it would be in your best interest if, right? And um, the Twitter files, which were released by Matt, I'm not sure how to pronounce Matt it, Taibbi, Taibbi um, really demonstrate clearly that the government was pushing social media to do censorship ever since uh, at least 2020. I'm shocked. I, I read an article today on antiwar.com that indicates that, that um, people who criticize the Ukrainian war and really, they're not pro-Russia, they just are criticizing that war and saying that it should stop, essentially. Um, uh, are, but people who are perceived to be pro-Russia or pro-Putin, those people are going to be really... No. They're not perceived to be. They're, 
The lie that's created, accused, right? the lie that's created, is anybody who opposes U.S. foreign policy right. on that area is either a puppet of Hamas or a puppet of Putin. Okay, well, let's go back to that because that what has happened in our community is something that um, I really would need like to talk to you about. So, but also this is true nationwide. We had a bunch of protesters here, pro Palestine. Um, pro-Palestine liberation. Those, and they had a student group called um, Students for Justice in Palestine. Those, got, those people got booted off campus, and they're still booted off campus. The university told them that they were not allowed to be, they were suspended from campus. Right, for being anti-Semitic, even though uh, most of them, they, a lot of them were Jewish. I don't know if it was most. I was going to say a disproportionately large percentage of the protesters were Jewish. Yes. And they even held a Seder. Right. What I was, and I was there, so I observed yeah. it. I was right. at, they had an encampment, and they were trying to state clearly that they were uh, anti-war, the, the war between, between or of Israel, basically, on Gaza, the state of Israel on Gaza. Uh, Hamas and on Gaza. That's what they were doing. They were protesting. I went there and I was going to speak to them, but they were too busy having a Seder to be spoken to, which indicates that many of these kids and young people and protesters are Jewish and they are against this war as they have every right to be. But anyone against this war is being perceived as anti Semitic. Correct? Being, I would say being smeared. Yeah, being smeared. As anti-Semitic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we only have a couple yeah. of minutes left. There is something I want to say yeah, that, that departs from this. Um, all my life, my concern about free speech was not only about your right or someone else's right to speak, but my right to hear whatever yes, anybody exactly, has to right. say, and that is absolutely central to any kind of democracy. If the government has the right or the ability to stop you from hearing a perspective because it doesn't agree with that perspective and, you know, whatever lie they use to, uh, to smear it with, whether it's misinformation, malinformation, uh, hate speech, fighting words, whatever, uh, if I don't get to hear all perspectives, I cannot make, as a voter, I cannot make an intelligent decision and therefore we're not in a democracy. Um, I don't see a whole lot of difference between this election and, you know, Putin's recent election, yeah, right. except we have two non-choices where there they only had one choice, one non-choice. Well, they had other candidates. They did. I right. Mean, yeah, they had right. their equivalent of, and I'm going to be voting for Green. But we don't honestly. I regard myself as a U.S. citizen. Let us criticize our own government fiercely. You know, I don't know what happened in Russia, and neither do you, because that might all be nonsense too, from our government's point of view. It might be that he legitimately got yeah, 98 elected. or whatever percent be. of the vote. It might be. But I or think it it's might also, not be. But it's also true that opposition candidates. Who were viable candidates mm -hmm. were were treated as criminals and oh, not allowed to. Wait, wait. Okay, where did you All hear right. that? You heard it from the U.S. Maybe it's no, true. Heard it from. I haven't heard it denied by anybody. Okay, but let's, by any source, and well, I check all the sources. Well, then you don't read RT. Okay, Russia Television, R Russia Today. Okay, well, thank you, Barry, for being with us, and I hope to talk to you again. Let's get on with it with fighting this attack on free speech. Thank you. Right. Without free speech, we'd be living in a swamp. That's we? that's from a Dylan yeah, okay. song. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. See you in the month.